The United States economy boomed during the 1920s, but it also had signs of weakness. Businesses produced more goods than consumers could afford. Farmers suffered from low prices for their crops. Debt was high. Then, in 1929, the stock market crashed. Soon, factories began to cut back. Workers were laid off. The good times ended, and the Great Depression began. Unemployment reached an all-time high. Because people did not have jobs, they could not afford to buy food. They were forced to rely on soup and bread lines to survive. Poverty and suffering spread across the country. The Great Depression hit farmers hard. Those in Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, and New Mexico suffered even more when a natural disaster struck. During World War I, farmers in these states had grown more wheat to meet demand for food for soldiers. To expand cropland, farmers had plowed and torn up the grasses that had maintained the soil stability. When the war was over, livestock was reintroduced to the area. Hooves trampled the soil, loosening it even further. In addition, rainfall accumulation dropped in the plains region, drying the land. Droughts struck the plains throughout the 1930s. These droughts turned the soil to dust. As a result, the Southern Plains came to be called the Dust Bowl. Starting in 1934, strong windstorms hit the area and the loose soil blew up, forming black dust clouds that reached as far as four miles into the sky and traveled as far as 3,000 miles. On April 14, 1935, one of the largest dust storms hit the Southern Great Plains. The day began as a pleasant one. Then, all of a sudden, a large black cloud appeared. It quickly swallowed up anything in its path. People were forced indoors to avoid the choking black storm. That day is now referred to as Black Sunday. The mix of drought, loose soil, and dust storms caused crops to fail, livestock to starve, and farmers to lose everything. One of President Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal programs addressed the Dust Bowl. In 1935, the Soil Conservation Service was created. This program implemented new techniques like crop rotation and planting shelter belts in an effort to save farmland. In crop rotation, a farmer plants one crop one season and another crop the next, keeping disease and insects from settling in the area. Farmers also leave some of their fields unplowed each year, allowing the soil to build back its nutrients. A shelter belt is a strip of trees or large shrubs that is planted alongside farm fields. The trees block the wind, preventing it from kicking up soil. These practices could help, but they needed time to take effect. Before the trees could grow tall enough, the terrible dust storms continued. Many farmers felt they had no hope. Unable to grow crops, farmers had nothing to sell. Thousands of people lost their land as a result. Farmers were forced to migrate west. Many loaded their jalopies and took Route 66 through the desert to California. They hoped to find work picking fruit and working the fields. They expected better lives. Author John Steinbeck portrayed this movement to California in his famous book, The Grapes of Wrath. The Grapes of Wrath focuses on the Joad family, uprooted farmers from Oklahoma. It has become a classic account of the human toll of the Dust Bowl. If you read the letters of the migrants who are coming in, they are influenced by Hollywood images. They're influenced by uh, fruit crepe labels that they've seen that describe the sense of luxury, not just a little bit better than, than Oklahoma, but really a place where your dreams come true. And certainly that theme is absolutely central to the Grapes of Wrath because each member of the Jode family and the others that are traveling westward with them have a piece of the California dream, something that's calling them here. And we find as the novel progresses that those pieces of the dream fall flat. When the migrants arrived in California, they came into a state that already had considerable turmoil of its own. Uh, California did not escape the Great Depression. There were lots of people here who were looking for work. There were a lot of people who were living marginally. After a long, hard journey, refugees entered California full of anticipation and hope, but they found more hardship. Large corporations owned most of the farmland, and they controlled employment. 
There were plenty of local people to work in the fields, so there were not many jobs for the migrants. Homeless and jobless, many migrants were left to fend for themselves. They lived in tents or cardboard shacks without water or electricity. Most were hungry and many grew sick. Rather than using their surplus produce to help the needy migrants, the farm companies destroyed it to keep prices high. In The Grapes of Wrath, Steinbeck expressed his outrage. There's a crime here that goes beyond denunciation. There is a sorrow here that weeping cannot symbolize. The fertile earth and the ripe fruit and children dying of pellagra must die because a profit cannot be taken from an orange. The people come with nets to fish for potatoes in the river, and the guards hold them back. In the souls of the people, the grapes of wrath are filling. Steinbeck's book brought the suffering of the migrants into the public eye. Some people were outraged over the treatment of these Americans. Others, like FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, thought the book was a false picture of reality. Hoover considered Steinbeck a danger to freedom and democracy and accused the author of being a communist. First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt toured the migrants' camps and witnessed how the people lived. Her support of Steinbeck's book silenced many of its critics. By 1941, the drought in the plains was over, and many of the soil conservation programs were working. But millions had already moved from the plains states and settled into new lives and livelihoods, away from the homes they once knew.